Okay, um, I think it's started. Are we going to introduce ourselves? Or Go on then. Uh, my name is William Large. Uh, Dave Webster. I'm his enemy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and we're going to talk this morning about um, Buddhist ethics and questions been sent in by Mr. McCain's class from High Wycombe, I think, which is like near east of Swindon. It's a bit higher than Low Wycombe, isn't it? Um, right. uh, anyway, I'm working on some questions about Buddhist ethics and we're going to deal with them. Do you find my jokes funny anymore? First set of them um, have been written um, by a student and they've got a title, um, Questions for Buddhist Guy. Yeah, um, I like the title especially, Questions for Buddhist Guy. I like the idea that Dave Webster is now known as Buddhist Guy and I thought I might call him that from now on. Yeah, I was going to get a costume. But we're quite excited about these questions and I'm quite excited to find out what Dave can actually say in answer to them. So the first one, number one. Surely there's no difference between a commandment, as in the Ten Commandments, mm. and a path, as in the Buddhist path. As you can choose to follow either or take the consequences of either result. Um, and that's not actually a bad question. You, know, you might think, well, Buddhism is often portrayed as very different from theistic religions like Christianity and Judaism. Um, and yet you might look at it and say, well, actually, they've got the Ten Commandments in um, Judeo-Christian thought, and then you've got the um, Four Noble Truths and the Holy Eightfold Path in Buddhism. Uh, what Buddhists would probably be keen to point out, um, how convinced you are of the matter, is that the Eightfold Path isn't a set of commandments. Rather, um, it's more styled as a set of like training rules but, uh, or conditional um, statements like, if you want to achieve the goals of Buddhism, these are the steps you'll need to take to make to do so. So they're not as... Um, they're not a, a command that says, you must do that. They rather say... If you want to achieve these goals, uh, these are the steps you need to take to do so. And in a sense, they're also largely, um, certainly some of them, are all moral. So they're not all about your behaviour towards the people or your religious behaviour. Some are very much uh, meditative um, and some are doctrinal. I have an extremely clever question to ask you about this. Okay. Um, am I allowed to ask it? Yeah, for sure. Well, I would say that the difference between the Ten Commandments and the Buddhist path, although I'm no expert on the second as you are, is that Ten Commandments are heteronymous in the Kantian sense, they're a rule that comes from the outside. Mm. You know, uh, uh, God spoke to Moses, Moses took the commandments down to the Israelites and the Israelites had to follow these rules. They can't question them. Mm. Whereas the Buddhist path is an appeal to autonomy. It's it's less of a kind of heteronymous law. It's more about how you develop yourself as a person. Yeah, and I think that I think the idea of rules for kind of self development or training principles very much fits with that. And this idea that, according to Buddhism particularly, it's not only about them being autonomous in themselves. They're about it's about achieving autonomy mm. because when you are normal, a mere worldling, as most of us are according to Buddhism, we're actually not that free. We're not that autonomous because we're driven by a whole bunch of our, of our greed, our hatred, uh, and our ignorance. And as we develop along the path, we shed a lot of our greed and hatred, we shed a lot of, shed a lot of our ignorance, and we become freer and more autonomous. And the thing we thought we were free, and we realised how much we were limited as we start to cast off these kind of uh, psychological religious chains. Mm. Good. So shall we go to the second Yeah, question? the second question for... Surely if you can interpret the path... I'm not sure I can even read that, sorry. Uh, then we all achieve enlightenment in our own way. Thank you. I suppose years of reading genius <laughs> essays. Um, it shows you don't read them. I do uh, read them. Uh, but I guess the idea that if we can interpret the path, um, that mm, there's no real normative sense in which we have to do it a set way. Mm. Uh, I'd say in Buddhism, actually, there has been, historically, um, this has been issued Buddhism. Because different traditions, both within the same geographical and historical area and then spread across them, have chosen to interpret what it means to tread in the way of the Buddha, the way of the Dharma. What that means has come to mean historically very different things in different places. So actually, the question picks out quite a serious problem for Buddhism, um, which is how do we, given the nature of Buddhism, impose certain views or impose a view of the path? Actually, they... Most forms of Buddhism still believe that, although there's some room for interpretation, 
there are fundamental principles underlying the path. Principles to do with lack of harm towards others, um, a shedding of certain kinds of negative desire, um, a veneration of the idea of wisdom or insight, and in almost all traditions, the veneration of the idea of compassion. So although there's loads of room for interpretation, if it doesn't if it doesn't model those values or those characteristics, then you can say you're straying too far from the path. But well, couldn't somebody say to you that any one of those values could be interpreted right down to the bottom? Like, what do you mean by compassion? Yeah, I mean, and Buddhism is... What do you mean is, uh, by negative desire? That, that there's no end to that interpretation. Uh, and Buddhism is kind of, to a large extent, wrangled with that. And a lot of traditions, you'll see in the Far East, sort of traditions that have taken a very different, more figurative view of that and ended up integrating it with quite combative, um, quite martial, military cultures. Um, most forms of Buddhism once said that you come down to an experiential verification of those things. Actually, pain and suffering are things that we are familiar with and know and recognise in others. And actually, the co- we can therefore talk about the causing of them in relation to the other. Uh, so it's in terms of, we know what we're talking about. We have this sense in which we verify these principles not through appeal to an external judge, not through appeal to a rational principle, but through appeals to both general experience, we know it's like to be punched, um, but also special experience through meditation. So I punch you now as an illustration of that? That'd be really, that'd be really fantastic, no. Um, Next question. Yeah. If Buddhists commit good actions simply because they're sanctioned? They're scared of getting, scared of getting a bad... A bad rebirth, I presume. Bad rebirth. Then that's a that's a wrong action, and you'd then get bad karma. It's not right. It's yeah. not right. Well, this I think is a problem in all religions. If religions say certain kinds of actions lead to benefits, heaven, good rebirth, rewards, and certain kind of actions lead to punishment, then you you open up the door to taxation that says, well, it's all very well you being nice to people, but you only being nice to people for your own benefit. And therefore, there's no, there's no real praiseworthiness or moral benefit so in it. It's just self-interested. Yeah, uh, and this is, I mean, what Kant seems to get at say the performance of what right, what is right, is kind of almost trivial. Kant hate Buddhists. Yeah, he didn't know anything about them. No, but that doesn't stop him. No, it didn't stop him hating them. Um, but he's, you know, he is very much hate is probably too strong a word. Yeah, was he disinclined was... towards them. That's better. Yeah, yeah, uh, more moderate. Um, but. In the kind of Kantian ethical thinking, you have to do the, to be kind of praiseworthy morally. You have to do the right thing for the right reason, and the right reason is because it's the right thing to do. Mm. So doing it because gives. So in Buddhism, there's um, what's often called a kind of graduated teaching that says, well, actually, it's not bad to say to people, don't go around punching kittens and being mean to people, because bad things will happen to you. It's quite effective. Mm. But that's seen as a kind of rudimentary step then takes you to a consideration later on the path, and this image of the path keeps cropping up in Buddhism, um, because ultimately you come to realise though that there's something intrinsically wrong about those actions. That you, yes, you don't do them because you want to avoid suffering for yourself, but you come to see suffering as a negative value for you and for others. And because of various Buddhist teachings about not-self, that difference between, between my suffering and your suffering starts to get worn away, chipped away. So the suffering you feel and the suffering I feel, although they're located differently, they're not really different. And it's about reducing both. And so good actions are actions which are motivated ultimately by compassion. But um, Buddhism has a lot to say about this later in terms of um, whether you should teach slightly false ideas to people to get them on sight on the path in later Buddhism. But in all forms of Buddhism, the idea that somehow Moral motivation might need a bit of a prod to get it going. Um, and also, the Buddhist view is, well, that's the way the world is. Mm. That's just, you know, it's just description of reality. Well, it is, I mean, even though Kant didn't know much about Buddhism, yeah. that is very similar to his lectures on education, where he says that till about the age of 12 or 13, then you teach the child moral actions through punishment, mm. through some external punishment, which is similar, I suppose, to... The religious idea of karma or whatever that if you don't mm. if you do x then y will happen to you but at a certain age a uh, person as they develop should act morally because they know it's right not because of any external reward 
than yeah. they get. But I guess the, the idea, which you, I guess you find in Aristotle as well, you need to habituate good action. Mm. But once you get older, starting to try and think about what's the right thing to do isn't going to happen. You need to naturally, almost naturally, but you know, instinctively. Can I ask you a question? Why, why yeah. is suffering at the heart of Buddhism? Why can I not say, well, life isn't that bad? Life is joyful. Mm. And that's actually one of the questions that somebody else asked. Which, oh, right. So well, wait till then. Well, well, partially, I think it's important. Because Buddhism isn't always about suffering, other than the point of the Buddha's renunciation, why he leaves his good life and he leaves his wife and child and steals off in the night, is that he's realised all human life, which is pleasurable, is still marked by suffering. That even in your most joyful moment you might feel, there's still a, a sense of anticlimax, a sense of its temporiness, that even when you're at your most blissful, well, you might think, you know, I'm really happy. I'm, I'm quite blissful now. Yeah, and all is well. But you know that it won't last. But later today you have to do unpleasant things that aren't as nice as this. Don't, and, don't you know, um, and so that, that even even our most pleasant moments are marked with finitude, the fact that we're mortal, that things come to an end, that the things, the people and things we love are all temporary and will soon be rotting in their grave. Mm. That's quite upsetting. So the Buddha's quest, in a sense, if you can put it in those terms, when he leaves his family, is how can I find true and, has, ha, true and lasting happiness in a world marked by suffering and change of finitude? Isn't that similar to Nietzsche's idea that you should find joy in suffering? That you should even affirm the suffering? No. no. I think he, um, Buddhism, I think, in almost all senses, says in the suffering, actually, is what you can find within it is an analysis of it that allows you a way out of it. And the way beyond suffering is a way of characterizing what the Buddhist path claims to be a kind of a pilgrimage away from human misery, not a, a kind of Nietzschean laughing and reveling in it in a kind of Dionysian fashion. Oh, right. Which do you prefer? Uh, I'm not sure that that's an appropriate question. <laughs> um, okay, question. I think we're on question four now. Mm. What do you do when the Eightfold Path and the Five Precepts contradict each other? And that's a good question because it crops up in a lot of different religions. If you've got any set of moral rules and the precepts are the guidance or moral rules that say don't kill and um, don't take intoxicating drugs, don't um, take that which is not given and they're interpreted differently by monastic and by lay Buddhists. But what do you do when religious rules come into conflict? Because what Buddhism has had um, from its very outset, really, are religious institutions. It's had the monastic community. Um, and as anyone studying Buddhism will have found out, um, Buddhism loves lists and it loves rules. So the monastic orders have actually tied themselves historically in all kinds of knots about these kind of um, conflicts. And often the early schisms in Buddhism weren't over really important philosophical issues. They were over... Um, whether people who committed certain um, mistakes should be allowed back in the, the Sangha or not. They were over rules. So really, there's been a massive argument about what are the major rules, what are the minor rules, what rules have exceptions that can be broken, what can't. So on one hand, there's a Buddhist tradition of arguing, bickering, fighting about all these issues. Very Buddhist. Yeah, very, very weak. <laughs> um, and Buddhist, Buddhism historically, in terms of its institutional incarnations has always loved detail and loved to argue about these things. Um, but on the other hand, you also find Buddhists who say, well, ultimately principles about the reduction of suffering trump all this. And these these rules aren't rules like we think of commandments. They are attempts to make manifest a kind of principle which is rather hard to articulate. And the fact that we sometimes um, they seem to conflict is to do with our articulation and our language, not with the principle. And the principle is what the Buddha said when he's asked, you know, why are you here? He says, I've come to teach only one thing, and that is suffering the way beyond it. Which almost sounds like two things. <laughs> <laughs> but the, suffering the way beyond it is going to... And therefore, everything else is an attempt to think, how do we do that? So ultimately, when things conflict, you have to kind of go back to these first kind of principles and say, well, not quite, what would the Buddha do? Um, but how how do you kind of take Buddhist values and principles and apply them to the situation rather than saying how do we get these rules to fit? I think that tension is there in any any 
um, ethics or spirituality because it's a conflict between the rule and the application of the rule. Yeah. You can have a rule, which in itself might make sense or not, but as soon as one applies it to reality, there will always be contradictions and paradoxes. That then develops debate and discussion, and then you, that's, you know, it's again, going back to Kant, Kant would say, you know, students think, I don't know why I'm talking about Kant so much, but students think they can contradict Kant because Kant says you should never lie. Mm. And then student says, well, what if you had a Jew in your, in your um, house and the Nazis, and Gestapo yeah. turned up, you, would you lie and say they were well, of course, Kant said, of course you would lie, because there's always a difference between the rule and mm. its application. Mm. And that, that's always the problem. There's always a gap between the two. Yeah, I think the mistake is thinking that Buddhists, for example, or Kant, or thinks that their set of rules is it done now, done mm. ethics, put it in books. You know, and actually, they're not stupid enough to think that the world is as neat as the rules. Mm. The world is appallingly messy and complicated and grey. And the rules is just an attempt to try and kind of articulate a a way of being in response to the mm. world. And sometimes it won't quite fit, because it can't fit all circumstances. But there's a tendency to think, ah, gotcha, if the rules don't fit or there's a conflict. What would you say to somebody like me who finds Buddhists really irritating? I find their calmness, their inner calmness, and their holiness, it just irritates me. And I know why it irritates me, because I, t I think, surely, or anything that's great about human beings is comes out of a refusal to accept suffering that despair is the is the well of creativity and that if you in a certain sense overcome suffering you become i think nietzsche says buddhists are like cows mulching mm. the grass yeah. and there's something there's something terrible about it's like you're turning down the turning down the volume so everything yeah everybody's calm and happy but then nothing yeah, I mean, it's created. there are two answers to that, I think. Well, the first answer is that it it's tells, very Western me, view, I it tells me much about, a lot about you <laughs> and not much about Buddhism. And it's a very self-revealing, psychological kind of a, a statement, which is thank you. You're welcome. Um, but secondly, that's one interpretation of Buddhism. And it's certainly not how Buddhism has come to act in a lot of contexts. So the Western interpretation of Buddhism and the way it's been in the West often leads us to think that there's a calming, this idea of, all passion is bad. And we have this Western view that the only thing worse than a life, that, uh, a life of passion is one without it. You know, and the idea that passion is the engine behind art and behind all the things. A lot of Buddhist tradition would say that actually passions and desires are fine if we need to, what we need to do is remove from them the attachment that goes with them and the things about desire that causes, causes us to have various negative consequences. So we somehow can we articulate a passion for creativity or art or all those things without being attached to the fruits of that desire? And some forms of Buddhism believe, yes. Let's look at the passion and the art and things of um, Tantric Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and Far Eastern Buddhism. Um, and interesting, the Buddhisms that have become popular in the West, historically partly um, in Britain, certainly, for example, because of colonialism and the various links, um, and Southeast Asian forms of Buddhism, tend to be those that have promoted calm. Uh, and that's often contrasted with the freneticness of life. And they've slotted into a certain cultural um, niche or frame about being opposed to modern life. And you know, Nietzsche kind of takes this idea of what he knew of Buddhism. Which he mostly knew through Schopenhauer. Yeah, exactly. You know, and who wouldn't dislike you if Schopenhauer was for it? <laughs> if Schopenhauer's for it, everyone's against, much against it. Yeah, everyone's yeah. against it. That seems fair. Um, but generally speaking, um, the Buddhism that Nietzsche is against is a quietist Buddhism. You, know, you talk about turn down the volume, it's a view of Buddhism as quietism. And actually, a lot of forms of Buddhism say Buddhism isn't quietism. But Buddhism is about, it's about achieving sufficient states of calm to make good decisions about what causes harm and not harm. And actually, the despair that you go through in meditation is often much more substantial. Mm. Than um, people to think. People think most people start to learn to meditate. Everything's fine. Actually, most people who talk to people who do a lot of meditation or have them, they say it's really hard and miserable and difficult. And they, when they go to do it, they often feel I'm not going to have fun chilling out and have blissed out Buddha trance lounge music. Yeah, I'm suppose... going to really face my difficulties and think about mortality. Agreed. And actually, that that often spurs them to be quite creative and loud and interesting people. I suppose 
I'm thinking about the thing I'm the, the caricature of Buddhism. I'm thinking about is like Western Buddhism, no, which I yeah, yeah no, which absolutely. I find really bizarre. But the other thing, I mean, I suppose that Nietzsche, I think you're right to say he's what he has in mind is a certain quietism. But I think he thinks, which I think is interesting metaphysically. I think he thinks that you know he's actually quite complimentary about Buddhism a lot in his writings, mm. but he still thinks there's a kind of world hating theme in it. Yeah, there's I something think, terrible about this world, and we the, the most important thing is to escape it. I think in some versions of Buddhism, which he, is true of most religions, he, he kind of has a few. Yeah, absolutely, because they want to transfer value to a, a metaphysical um, entity, ex, you know, mm. external or or unseen. Often it's not external, but it's not. So it's not what, yeah, It's not what the world appears to be. It's mm. as the world really is mm. behind the veil of mm. Maya, mm. kind of Hindu idea. Um, and you do find that in Buddhism, and, and there's a, certainly a danger in some formulations of Buddhism that they, because of the concentration on how to overcome suffering, things that can bring suffering, that it then starts to characterise the world and characterise the experience of being in the world as an awful thing. Well, actually, what many Buddhists would try and point to, I think, is the idea that if actually you take the steps that the Buddha recommends in terms of what's on the path, your experience of the world as pleasant, as blissful, as exciting, as stimulating, as wonderful, increases rather than decreases. That Actually, what drains the life and colour out of the world is the fact we can't deal very well with finitude, change. And that once we start to get a handle on that and accept it, um, we can enjoy something much more once we, we're at peace with, that's the right phrase, the idea that it's just a temporary passing thing rather than desperate, having this desperate rush to hold on to everything. Once we have that, that kind of letting go of the anxiety, because it's not, it's not a letting go of everything, but it's a letting go of the anxiety and attachment. And if that, that, that drops away, there's an argument to be made that actually your experience of things, be they physical sensations, uh, interaction with the people, whatever, become much more full and much more enriched and actually seem to match much more this idea that you I think, in Nietzsche, of a life that's very fully lived and is full of, you know, Nietzsche very famous to me, full of kind of dance and music and passion and arts and things. Actually, one view is that Buddhism allows you to get rid of the things that stop you enjoying that and the stand away of it. Mm. Right, I think last, last question last thing, yeah. for the Buddhist guy. Isn't Buddhism more of a belief system than a religion due to lack of a deity? Um, I mean, there's, there's this dangerous... Dangerous, wrong word. There's a common trope, I guess, or kind of image that comes up a lot in student essays that says, whatever religion has been discussed, oh, Buddhism isn't a religion, it's a way of life. Mm. But you also find books that open saying, Islam isn't a religion, it's a way of life. Christianity isn't really a religion. So all religions say about themselves that they're not really a religion like others because religions are bad things. We've got this negative connotation now in the, in the public mind. Um, but Buddhism particularly seems to have that um, said about it because it doesn't have a date in the same way. Mm. That's not to say it's atheistic. You, know, might, you might say that early Buddhism and certainly most of what comes to be known as Theravada Buddhism is non-theistic um, but then you get a lot of Mahayana forms of Buddhism that have these uh, Bodhisattvas and various kind of heavenly Buddha figures and things and so there was a lot of opportunities for devotion and practice. So in many parts of the world Buddhism becomes more religious than its earlier formations or some of its Southeast Asian formations. Um, but is it really what makes something a religion merely the fact that it has a deity? Or is it to do with the idea that there is some form of ultimate solution to the metaphysical problems we face in life, like well, Nirvana? I think you're right. I mean, although I think that's a very interesting question, I think it's a very Western and it's a very philosophical way of thinking about religion. Because I would say that practices come first, and then propositions about a deity or a belief in deity come second. So in some sense, no matter whether you're talking about Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, what's central to a religion is a way of life. All religions are a form of practices, and then on, are those practices sustained through some kind of belief system? Yeah. And that's why actually when you look at a religion, the belief system is so um, mixed up. All, all over. I mean, there's different ways that Buddhists practice through history, different way, what Buddhists believe in. There's whole different forms of Buddhism. You know, can't say that yeah. Buddhism is X, Y, and Z. I don't know, as simply as that. 
Yeah, absolutely. and even Christianity, you know, look at the kind of space well, of belief in terms of Christianity that you know have given up on God. It's like yeah. Meister Eckhart, and yet some forms of kind of liberal Anglicanism that mm. have a view of God which is very metaphorical, mm. um, and then compare that to, to much more fundamentalism, fundamental views that take those very literally. But they would always describe themselves as Christian, uh, and I think the view that you were kind of outlining is what a sociologist would say, mm. not to insult you. But, you know, to say, you know, a sociologist well, would say... Some philosophers would say the same. Yeah, thing. and you might, you know, you sound almost a bit like Wittgenstein. Talking yeah, about Wittgenstein Stein would Cohen. say it. Kierkegaard um, would say it. Yeah, I and mean, that's a better recommendation. Mm. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. To say, it that because it hasn't got a God, it isn't a religion, is to say, well, I believe, therefore, that religions are systems of belief about gods. Mm. Actually, in practice, religions are slightly more than that, with slightly more broad than that. Um but I think we'll stop there. That was a full set of questions that were very interesting. Uh, and then we'll move on in a minute to more questions after we've had some more flapjack.